Self-deception may be one of the worst kinds of deception that there is to mankind. Lying to somebody else and trying to trick them, that's bad. And, and usually ends up rebounded on top of the one who told it. <clears throat> and, and it's bad. Just it's, it's a, from a moral perspective, it's bad. But deceiving oneself, being unwilling to acknowledge things that are objectively true, this could be the worst because the consequences very often won't just rebound upon you, but they'll accrue immediately upon your head. We are in a situation like this right now in our uh, in terms of our relationship with the Russia-Ukraine war and our just abject unwillingness at nearly every level across the Western world to acknowledge ground truth reality, to come to common sense, rational policy outcomes in, in response to what's true and, and ending the, the harm, cutting your losses when you don't have a good path to success so that you maintain your position of strength and power going forward. <clears throat> That's what wisdom does. Wisdom says, I want this outcome. I would prefer this one. I'm going to try to get it. And then when your efforts don't succeed and then you see the ways and the means and the, the end results that are desired are incompatible, then you say it would be foolish, foolish to ignore the, the fundamentals that we've just acknowledged and to continue to move forward on a preferred outcome that can't rationally be met. That's what we should do. And instead, we are deceiving ourselves into believing many things that simply aren't true are incompatible with reality as it observes on the ground. Now, the most recent example of this is uh, the, this, the interview that uh, the president of France, Emmanuel Macron, gave to a couple of stations in France a couple of days ago, back on, I believe it was Thursday of last week. Much of that has been reported upon, but as we always do on this channel, I'm going to show you what was said, what many of the news media reported, especially the major media. And then I'm going to tell you what the reality is underneath it. Things that almost nobody else and, and absolutely nobody else that I have seen because I've looked have explained the things that I'm about to show to you. And I'm going to show you why it's self-delusion, self-deceit and harmful to our country because France this is, this is what France is doing right here, but because they're in NATO and trying to be a leader in NATO and we're connected to it and we have Article 5 obligations, there's ramifications for us as well. Now, as I'll touch on at the end of this, uh, France is not the only violator of this. We're unfortunately right in there with them and giving them a run for their money to see who can be the biggest self-deceivers. But for the purpose of this video right here, I want to show you why many of the things that Emmanuel Macron said just don't line up with reality. First of all, let's take a look at what he said uh, was the reason for this war, where it came from in the first place. For the last 10 years, because this all started in 2014, Russia launched a war of aggression against Ukraine. Then we did everything we could to establish peace. Everything. The Minsk agreements, the negotiations conducted under the aegis of France and Germany with Ukraine and Russia. Right here in this very room. The only meeting between President Zelensky and President Putin on the 9th of December at the end of the year. And Russia, the Kremlin regime once again decided for itself in February 2002 to launch the second stage of this offensive, a full-scale war against Ukraine. And not just the Donbass because he's not telling us his limits. He regularly bombs Kiev, attacks Odessa and so on. We have an objective. Russia cannot and must not win this war. For two years, we've been helping Ukraine. And if things were to get out of hand, it would once again be Russia's sole responsibility. Russia's responsibility. So, to, to be very clear at the end there, anything that happens bad from this point is the sole responsibility of Russia. As it was, as he said at the beginning of that section, Russia started this war. Just this complete... Unprovoked aggression, according to Manuel Macron, and even though all of the, during the intervening time since 2014, they did everything in their power to try and reach a, a peaceful negotiation, but Putin wouldn't have it. That's what he's trying to convey to the French public and to anyone in the West who is watching this. That Yeah, it's those darn Russians for no good reason they've done this. Well, now, first of all, as if you've been watching our channel any amount of time, you know that the events in 2014 and it actually started in late 2013 are anything but but clean from our hands. We had a lot to do with overthrowing 
the legally elected government that we didn't like because it was it leaned towards Russia in Ukraine at the time. We didn't like it. We didn't like their policies. And so when <clears throat> events started happening and discord internally started happening, we facilitated it. We helped the opposition to overthrow the elected government. So even from the outset, you can't say that, that we had nothing to do with it. You can't say it was the sole issue with Russia. You can say that Russia did things that were unethical, immoral, and illegal in, in helping to, to foment the violence that can, that started afterwards with the civil war that began between the east and the west of the country. That's valid and it's fair. But it's, it's, it's self-deceiving to claim for no good reason Russia was doing this because we did nothing at all when we did have some issues there. Even bigger, I think, uh, his claim there in the middle that, look, we tried with these Minsk agreements, you know, that but right here in this very room, the room where it happened, he says for very dramatic effect, right here, we tried the Minsk agreements and Russia wouldn't have it. But really, is that how it worked out? Because if you've been paying any attention to the headlines that have been happening here since this war started off, the leader of Germany and subsequently the leader of France at the time, admitted that actually the Minsk agreement was never intended to be something that they would follow. It was just to buy time for the Ukraine to build up its military in case it needed to go to war. So even that, by our own admission, by the admission of his predecessor, they never had a serious attempt to implement the Minsk Accords, which could have and would have, by all likelihood, prevented the war in 2022 from breaking out. So there's your first right off the bat that everything that happened so far, everything that happened in the past has been sole fault of Russia. We're innocent in this. We're just reacting to things. Now it's going to get a little bit worse because now he's going to sit, go into what may be coming next. And as you just heard him say at the end of that one, anything happens at this point forward, it's going to be the sole responsibility of Russia. But listen to But now the situation on the ground in Ukraine is changing. The situation is much more difficult for them. Russia is getting tougher at home and stepping up its attacks. And so, yes, I say to you with the utmost solemnity, this beginning of the year, 2024, must be, for us, one of startup. So he's saying that, okay, we need to do something more. So whatever he's done up to this point, he's saying it's not enough. We need to continue to do more. Now, if you heard some of his comments before this, this uh, interview happened, everybody was had with bated breath to find out, you were saying something about no red lines and that we should stop using the vocabulary of limiting ourselves and maybe even sending troops in there. So in, in light of what he just said about we're going to change something up. And so whatever has been done up to this point, we need to escalate it. So then he was he subsequently is going to be asked about that, about the troops. But first of all, the next thing he says about self disillusion is that, holy cow of our existence, our very existence is at stake here. And when the presenter asked him, how is this exist? How is this actually an existential issue for France, which you've said, um, note his answer here. Europe and the security of the French are at stake over there. And these are our vital interests. You're using a term that has particular connotations. I say security. And you yourself have used the term existential threat. But I'm... That means it's our very existence that's at stake in the Say game. it, and I assume it. We've already suffered the consequences of this war in our daily lives. We've already suffered these attacks. Many of our hospitals have already suffered days and days of dysfunction due to Russian aggression. We've already suffered the consequences in Europe. The price of gas, the situation of our economy, the cost of cereals, the economic upheavals that have followed are the consequence of this war launched by Russia. See, all of those things he lists out there, all again, sole responsibility of Russia. So now France is paying a price here. Now, first of all, it's we should talk about, and the presenter tried to get there and he wouldn't have it. An existential threat is the very meaning of the term that you use, existential. You could literally be wiped off the map. Where did he even talk about the possibility of an existential threat to France, which is nowhere near Ukraine in Europe? So far, so he started ticking off some problems. So the best you can say is those are problems for France. Nothing close to being an existential threat because that's important. Because if something is a problem for you, you can handle it in any number of ways. If something is existential, 
then that raises the alarm bells to the to the roof and makes much more dramatic things possible to rectify a situation if you think your very existence is at stake. But what he listed off there were problems. Now, there's a big caveat with that, too, because he's talking about economic issues, energy issues, food issues. Now, why do you suppose those things are a problem? What's the genesis of those? It's the sanctions that France and the United States and all of Europe levied upon Russia. All of those things that, that he's talking about, their energy, regular economic things, specifically uh, uh, food items, uh, other things that you need to, to fertilizers, things to grow, agricultural issues. Every single one of those are a result of the sanctions that were put on by the U European Union against Russia to try and cripple their economy. That was the outstated out objective. And instead, it has backfired. And it is France who is paying problem. Russia's economy is actually growing at a faster rate than anyone in Europe. And many in Europe are actually, like Germany, are actually in a recession or went into recession because of a lot of these movements here. So it completely backfired. So when he's written there trying to tell the French people that this battle here, that I'm even using the terms possibly using troops on the ground into into the Ukraine war against Russia is because our existence is at stake, but it's because of the foolish policies that have been implemented by France, by the West up to this point, that is the result of the, the difficulties that are difficulties. These are problems, not existential threats that he's facing right now. So he's trying to solve one problem of his own making by accelerating and escalating the problem that could cause it to genuinely face an existential threat, which I'll touch on uh, a little bit longer in this video. But the next thing we want to move on to, unfortunately, that's not the end of it. Uh, <clears throat> then he goes on to say that uh, that there is a, a big risk here. And so he's going to try again to he's, he didn't get it with the details that she asked for. So he's going to try to move on to make it sound really scary by saying we're actually already at war. If Russia wins this war. Europe's credibility will be reduced to zero, will be reduced to zero. What would be the credibility on our soil of a power, the European Union, of its members who let this happen? What would be the security of Europeans? OK, you talked about credibility. Mm, glad this one was he was talking about this here. He's saying where is going to be the credibility if we allow Ukraine to lose? If we allow Russia to win, as though it could be a preference, we can just choose to or not to do it. And so we're going and doing something because it is patently, objectively, no path to a victory for Ukraine. None. There's none that exists, no matter how much money the U.S. Congress gives, how much more money Europe may give. There's no path to military victory for all the reasons you've heard me talk about many times on this channel before. You, if he's worried about our credibility, it's time to start saying when all of these eyes all around the world are watching this, our adversaries, our our other friends around the world, our other allies, just people who were neutral, who were kind of just kind of watching to see how this is going to go on. What do you think their credibility is going to be for the European Union and the United States when they see instead of just acknowledging what's patently obvious to the remain much of the world? You continue going on with this fiction that you can win, that you can impose a conventional defeat on Russia while not going nuclear. And everyone knows that that's nonsense and there's no path to that. It's, it's self-evident that it's so. That crushes your credibility. Why is anyone going to listen to anything you say when they see that you can't even acknowledge what's right in front of your eyes here? So that's why it keeps going on. You, you see nearly every one of these clips I'm showing is another example of why self-delusion is one of the worst things. All we should have to do is to acknowledge what's out there and then start putting in policies that match that. That raises your credibility among both adversaries and friends. But he wasn't finished there. He continued on. Now he's talking about how, you know, there's a bigger risk than you may think. And so today it's clear there's not a risk. There's war. As we speak, men and women are dying in Ukraine by President Putin. And what I'm telling you is that if Ukraine falls, our security is threatened. And so the time has come for us to resist. And we're in a time, and this is the time I'm taking on, to say that if Russia were to continue its escalation, if the situation were to deteriorate, we have to be ready. And we will be ready. And to be ready. And we will be ready. 
it's and will be ready to necessary. make the decisions to ensure that Russia never wins. So he keeps going back to that. We have to make sure that Russia never wins, and we have to be doing whatever it takes to escalate and step up to make sure that Russia never wins. Now, first of all, what kind of impact do you think that's happened on Russia? What do you think? How do you think all this is 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 striking the the Kremlin, Putin specifically, uh, and uh, the Russian military when they hear these kinds of things? Does anyone think, in their wildest imagination, that they start quaking in their boots? That after two and now more than two years of war, that they're going, "Golly, the the French army may be stepping up here. They may be doing stuff that and, and getting more involved in. Holy cow, we better we better quit." We just better stop fighting here and, and seek a negotiated settlement on whatever terms Zelensky wants. I mean, that, that's it's so absurd to even say it out loud. It just gets the eyes rolling. And yet he's not rolling his eyes. He's actually being serious when he says that kind of stuff. And you have to wonder what in the world is going on. Now, speaking of Zelensky, he's all for this. And he's, in fact, encouraging it. I would also like to recognize French leadership in Europe today. We appreciate the way President Macron is developing a strategic perspective for Europe, a perspective of real, lasting security that is only possible through Putin's defeat in this war. Now, there's a couple of other things here which which uh, bear commenting upon for both Zelensky and, and Macron to be able to say, yes, we want to keep going here and this this you know affects us all and we got to band together to be able to fight here. Francis is trying to scare Russia by saying we may get involved here and you don't want to be taking us on on top of whatever's going on in Ukraine on the you know, uh, ammunition and the weapons that we've been given. That's his intent here. But a couple of things bear observing here. I keep going back to the realities on the ground. Here's a couple of key ones here. This is this is what Russia is aware of because it's open source. And now you're about to be aware of it here. So France right now, and, and this was actually brought up by one of the presenters elsewhere in the in the clip in the interview, they're making about a hundred shells of artillery rounds per day. A hundred. That's that's uh, that's a, like I don't know, maybe maybe forty five minutes of use in some parts of the of the uh, of the the front currently. Forty five minutes uh, approximately. But by means of comparison, so that's about three thousand per month shells that that France in after two years of war that they're making on a, on a daily basis or on a monthly basis 3,000. what's Russia doing? Try 250,000 per month. By some accounts it's even more than that. There's some estimates, Western estimates that Russia will by the end of the year in the end of this year 2024 produce 4.5 million artillery shells of 152 millimeter that fit their cannons. So France at best has, uh, you know, barely enough for a few uh, minutes of fighting in a month. And you're going up against somebody who's got 4.5 million in a year. I mean, what, what kind of sense does that make? He also boasted in there several other times that they're making 75 Caesar cannons per year, per year. Russia is just cranking armored vehicles off multiple assembly lines that are all moving 24-7, multiple shifts every day. And, and you just can't help but add up that things are moving like this for France and they're moving like this for Russia off the screen. Russia is aware of this. France should be aware. Well, of course, their France is aware of this. But then you have to see how can you have that mental disconnect when all of the things that go into making war, all the things, and I, I keep harping on this all the time, the things that go into making national military power that gives a country the ability to express combat power on the tactical battlefield. When you look at those fundamentals, all of them are in Russia's favor and growing by the month. They keep getting worse and worse. So then by what logic would the Western leader of France come and say, we're now going to escalate the situation. We're going to take it up another notch and potentially put troops on the ground here. One of the other things that he said he was asked uh, during this presentation was that, uh, yeah, but now how is all this going to be uh, paid for? Because what you're talking about, you want to go on a massive armament up, but they ask, well, where's the money going to come from? Is it going to be, they're going to raise the taxes because they don't see a lot of money to be able to fund something that's going to even have a prayer of matching what the Russians are doing. 
And like so many other things, he didn't answer the question. He, he just said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, like I was saying over here a minute ago, and he never answered the question. They, they don't have the money. They don't have the physical capacity. And again, if you've watched our channel for any amount of time at all, you know that it takes a long time to ramp up those things. Russia, after a full, you know, move into a wartime economy by the, the fall of 2022 is, is now starting to really reap the rewards of that. It's a long lead time of all out operation, none of which France has made. Even the, the U.S. and all the European Union combined or, or allegedly is going to be somewhere around 1.4, 1.5 million shells by the end of the year against Russia's 4.5 million. News out in just the last 24 hours is that satellite imagery apparently is, is confirming that North Korea has significantly ramped up its support to Russia in military uh, terms. So that probably means one, five, two millimeter shells. It could also mean uh, uh, rockets, missiles of various types. So on top of the 4.5 million that Russia's getting, they could get millions more from North Korea. So they are just overwhelmingly, all the things that go into winning on the tactical battlefield that's produced at the national level are just going through the roof on the Russian side. And you have to start to really ask, why are, are you saying these things? Why is France going down this path that literally can't be met? They don't have the capacity or the money to be able to move this. So what's the val value of, you know, poking a stick in the eye of Vladimir Putin? We're going to get to that in just a second. But uh, one of the last things that, that he said here I, I really want to talk about uh, is that <clears throat> he, uh, Macron is saying, look, this is kind of a zero sum issue here. Uh, but he has profound disagreements with some who say, uh, yeah, you shouldn't, because many of NATO were saying, yeah, about the troops here. Watch how this exchange went. But I have a very profound disagreement. I think that today, in good conscience, choosing to abstain or to vote against support for Ukraine is not choosing peace. It's choosing defeat. And that's very different. And when they accuse you of instrumentalizing the conflict in Ukraine, We've already had this debate. In the service of We've already politics. had this debate. Finally, have... because the last presidential election was held a few months after the start of the February conflict in sea. Listen to this. You can't be serious. That's all I can say. It's not serious because the responsibility for this war, the responsibility for the blows to the Ukrainian front, is Russia's alone. Our responsibility is to be strong for peace. Our responsibility is to hold this European unity together. And every time we have achieved European unity from the outset, we were under the French presidency. And we'll get it. You'll see. It's about holding on to our unity. But it's also about being strong. It means being strong to deter. It means being strong to resist. It's about being strong for our security. So, again, she's asking him. She says, yeah, but this doesn't seem like it's working. And it seems like we're going down a wrong path on the ground there. And he's just like, no, no, you'll see. It'll be fine. You'll see. Because we need to be strong. We need to be strong for unity in NATO. NATO's not unified, folks. Look, there's already lots of anger about the Slovak president, uh, the Slovak leader, because they claim he, he's actually on Putin's side. Of, of course, Viktor Orban from, from Hungary. A uh, lot of disagreements with him. Uh, Erdogan down in Turkey. Can you imagine any of those actually wanting to go to a war with Russia or sending troops for any reason uh, that currently on the table? Of course they're not. I mean, there's big disputes, big disagreements within NATO itself. There's no unity. And then he wants to be strong for peace. But see, the thing is, he doesn't really want peace. What he wants is the capitulation of Russia, uh, them to completely leave all the territory of Ukraine and for Ukraine to win. That's how he's defining peace. That's not peace. That's dis that's self-delusion. It's not going to happen because the reality on the ground and all the things I keep telling you about fundamentally, very practically argue against that, that to have that aspiration is, is just ludicrous. It's not connected to reality. And yet he keeps pushing the line. And one of the next things that they, they ask again, they, they circle back to the whole point of troops on the ground, because that's one of the critical things. Uh, and watch this exchange. On the other hand, they have not decided to send any troops at all. But and they let you know as wait, soon as yes, you said but that. We can always come back to that, and I'm going to get to the bottom of it. That's what the French are asking. But they're absolutely do. right. But I say today, we've decided on this, and it's a change. We decided it in Paris. It's the start of a new awakening. 
then I tell you, we'll do what's necessary to achieve our goal. See, that's the scary part. He's like, he's like, I, I, I'm going to stay ignore, ignorant of this reality. I'm going to stay blind to the fact that virtually every other NATO nation told him we're not sending troops into Russia, especially Germany. Germany was very blunt about saying there will be no uh, German troops going to fight in the Ukraine. President Biden said there are no American troops that are going to go fight in there. Very straightforward. They said that. Now you have some others like Poland and I believe it was uh, Lithuania. One of the Baltic countries are also saying, yeah, maybe we should get that a little bit more. It makes a little bit more sense because of where they're located in their histories with Russia. That I can understand a little bit more, even if it's still disconnected from the reality. I can understand that desire a little bit, but not France. France should not be going down that path because everything augurs against this, but he's still staying with it. This is going to be a new path. So, I mean, everything that I have said here, everything that the presenters keep trying to ask him, his own countrymen, to say, to bring these issues up, how it's not going to work, and he stays locked into, no, this is going to be a new beginning and we have to be strong. I, I just truly don't understand what he's thinking but here. But if you want to know, especially on that issue of troops on the ground here, what Putin's thinking, consider this. Now, uh, the latest poll coming out of France is that the Macron has about a 24% approval rate. So that means there's a lot of disputes with, with uh, among the French population. We've already seen that even politically. Lots of political parties have come out against what he was saying here, saying some of the same things that we're saying here. And uh, that's, they're pushing back against that. On the Russian side, on the other hand, one of, the, one of the objectives we've had from the beginning, the West has, is to undermine Putin's authority, to undermine his support within his country so that maybe he'll topple from power and that they'll turn in on each other and they'll collapse. And instead, very predictably, if you know anything at all about uh, Russian culture or history, the exact opposite happened with that, too. Just like the opposite happened with the sanctions, it rebounded on us. So, too, does this. So here's the French president with 24 percent approval rating talking to a guy who just won an election with 88 percent of the vote. And I know everybody always thinks, well, no vote is free and fair in, in Russia. So, of course, that's not true, except that that nearly matches the 80 percent approval rating that the Western polls have uh, estimated that Russia, Putin has within Russia uh, so 24% to 80%. So of the country that actually is in an existential war, the Russian side, from their perspective, and they actually have, they actually are fighting against the uh, countries right now. Here's what he had to say in response when asked after his election yesterday. So after M Macron made those statements, here's Putin's response. Reuters agency, maybe it is a silly question, but nevertheless, Macron keeps saying about possible possibility of sending French European troops to Ukraine, and that's a matter of concern for the European nations. How do you think the full-fledged conflict between Russia and NATO, is it possible, and how probable is it? Well, I think everything is possible in the modern world, and as I said before, and it is clear to everyone that this will be one step away from a full-fledged World War III. So Vladimir Putin understands what's at stake here. Unlike uh, Macron and the Western leadership, he recognizes that his country is in an existential threat. So he's already fighting the neighbor on his border on the ground, but he's also fighting with the support of 50 other nations. We, we always have this, the, it's called the Ramstein Group meeting every, every uh, month to where the Secretary of Defense of the United States meets with all these uh, 49 other countries for a total of 50 that always try to get together and how can they help Ukraine fight. So he's fighting with against the weapons and the ammunition and the training and the uh, intelligence support, targeting, et cetera, against 50 nations. So to Russia, this absolutely is an existential fight. And so what he is saying, and we know this because of recent episodes we've had here from Russian experts, it is in their doctrine that if they actually feel threatened they will resort to nuclear weapons. Some think the chances are much higher uh, than, than others do. But he, again, very clearly points out it could be it could be a World War III. It could be a nuclear war if they make good on this threat here. And what else is Putin doing? What, besides what he just said right there, uh, he also announced in his victory speech here 
that uh, in response to many of these attacks that keep going into Russian cities, I don't know if you're aware of it, but uh, there's the city of Belgorod, which is very close to the Ukrainian border, which Ukraine has been shelling uh, recently. Uh, overnight, there was also cluster rounds used by the Ukrainian side, provided by the United States that landed in civilian areas of the, the city of Belgorod. It's not a military target. It's just a city. So the same thing that Ukraine routinely uh, accuses Russia of doing, they're doing into this city here. There's no military value in this. All it's going to do is stir the hornet's nest up, which is succeeding in doing. So Putin is announcing that in order to keep the Russian city safe, that he's very soon going to begin an operation to create a secure buffer zone in the northern part of Ukraine. So all this 600 mile kilometer front line that's been fighting in the east, uh, apparently it's now about to expand in the north as well. And uh, intelligence reports, especially British intelligence for weeks now, has been saying that Russia is on a military buildup. And by all accounts, they're preparing a large scale new offensive sometime in the May-June time frame. So apparently that's coming uh, potentially within just a month or two. We'll have to see how that plays out. But Russia is going to take action because, see, Russia is also looking at the ground, but they are acknowledging the ground truth realities that they have the capacity to make good on these threats here. You have Macron making all these threats, and he doesn't have the capacity to back it up. So what is that going to do to be strong? Be strong for peace. Unity. There is none of those things. The longer he goes on down this path, and the longer the United States supports that thinking, and because that also illuminates so much of our actions here. I mean, how many times have you seen clips on this channel and elsewhere where you have, you know, Secretary of Defense, National Security Advisor, the President, all saying, yeah, that Russia has to lose and we need to keep going. And this money is so important that we're trying to get out of Congress. It's not going to make, it's not connected to reality, folks. It's just not. It doesn't matter how much money you give. It's a manpower issue. Ukraine doesn't have it. Russia does. Russia has an industrial capacity. Ukraine doesn't. And over time, Russia and its allies are going to vastly outperform Ukraine and its allies who simply don't have the capacity. That's the reality. Now, I have advocated and will again here do so that the wisest course of action that the West could take, the wisest thing that you that uh, Macron could do in France is to recognize the, the, the paths. There's not a there's not a positive outcome. There is no path to victory here. So instead of throwing more billions of dollars and more armored vehicles and more ammunition into this black hole that will only delay the outcome. Let's have a negotiated settlement. Let's tell Ukraine that we will help them maintain the lines as best they can. So we will still give them some arms and ammunition, but only as long as they are openly seeking a negotiated settlement on the best terms they can get. That would be embarrassing for the West. It would be embarrassing. It would be humiliating. It would be probably politically catastrophic for Zelensky. He probably would not be able to stay in, in office because all he said from day one is that they're going to win. It's all he's ever told his population. They're going to win. They're going to win. They're going to win. And now all of a sudden to say we're going to seek a negotiated settlement probably would would he would fall from power, most likely. Or at least that would be a big risk. That's true. So everyone, you want to look at that. It's embarrassing for the West. It's politically bad for the, the leader of Ukraine. Uh, it's just embarrassing all the way around. That is, at the moment, the best case scenario for the West. The worst case scenario is to say, because I don't want to be embarrassed, I don't want to do something I don't want to do that I would dislike, I'm going to keep on with the fiction. I'm going to keep self-deluding myself and going down this path that can't succeed because I just want it to magically work out. It, it maybe in a month or two, it'll just magically work out. What's the most likely outcome in that case is that Ukraine will eventually lose on the battlefield. That at some point their army falls apart, even if they get this $60 billion. And, and by uh, according to many in, in Washington, they're getting close to some sort of a political agreement to where they can come up with some money. It ain't going to matter, folks. If that money comes up, I assure you, all the things that I've seen, all these battlefield developments, they're all going to continue in the direction of Russia. Might slow it down for a little while, but it won't stop it. And it might not even slow it down because that that's such a small amount of money compared to the, the need and how much has already been spent and, and, and squandered. It might not even slow it down. It's probably too late even for that. So the chances are higher the longer it goes that there is an eventual collapse of the front somewhere 
that the Ukrainian military gets so brittle it finally does break, even though they have fought this extraordinary heroism and performed incredible feats up to this point. But to ask them to do it permanently and perpetually against the combat realities is unrealistic in the extreme. And we put them in a position to foolishly and unnecessarily die for something that they can't attain. And, and at a great cost to their future and the rest of the country, that many of, much of which can still fall under Russian domination in the months ahead if it goes down to that. And certainly probably by the end of the year, first of next year, if things continue fighting that long. So your choices are either acknowledge reality and accept the embarrassment and seal this off while you still have a lot of Ukraine, while you still have the ability to have a negotiated settlement that has some parts that are good for a kid. Or you could ignore reality and face the consequences of, that are inevitable at some point. That's where we are, folks, right now. Self-delusion and, and seal this off and move on to try to make some changes or remain self-delusional and suffer even more consequences later on. We, it remains to be seen how it's going to go. I know how I hope it does. I know how I pray that we suddenly wake up. But I know also know how most likely human nature being what it is, we're probably going to go in the wrong direction. We'll see. And you can count on us to continue to go in step by step with you, telling you stuff like this, why things are the way they are and what's behind some of these statements that some of these leaders say and not just repeating and just putting clips on there without context that they say because people want to believe it. We're going to give you the truth because we're unintimidated and uncompromised. Folks, join us back uh, later today. We kind of have Matthew Ho back on one of our show's favorites. Always got some great uh, insights to give. Um, a former State Department guy, former combat veteran, Matt Ho, this afternoon at one o'clock. You're not going to want to miss that. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe. Listen, it, it's more important than you may realize uh, because that's one of the ways that that uh, YouTube wants to help spread this to other people so they understand what's going on as well. And, and they get more chances to find out the truth. So it's really important, more than you may think, for you to like these videos. So we ask you to like and subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, and then as you see on the screen here, also at uh, three o'clock this afternoon, uh, we've got uh, another special report to, to talk about. There's a permanent, uh, or there's a desire rather to permanently station an American combat brigade in Poland, moving us closer and deepening our uh, connections and attachments and our risk and financial outlays in there. And we're going to show you why that's not a good and what we should do instead. But uh, that's this afternoon at 3 p.m. Thanks, and we'll see you at 1 o'clock on Daniel Davis Deep Dive.